Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Kathleen, and I'll be your host throughout today's service. We'd love to know who's gathering together in this space. Where are you watching from? Is this your first time joining us? How long was your power out for? Could you take just a second and introduce yourself in the chat box or in the comment section? Because we really would love to welcome you. Our service today will be 45 minutes in length. We're going to sing some songs of musical praise and worship. And today, Cameron, who's a smart cookie, is our accountant manager here at Calvary. And he is going to be bringing us our teaching as we kick off our giving series. Let's just start off by singing some songs of musical worship together. I know. James 1, 16 to 18. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. 
He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Let's pray together before heading into our time of teaching. 
God, I thank you so much for the privilege that we have to worship you. I thank you, God, for this gift of technology that makes accessible our gathering and our service to those who can't make it in person. God, I hope that they feel included today. Would you be with them where they are, wherever they're watching from, God, wherever they find themselves today? Would you just be really, really strongly present with them? God, I pray specifically for anybody, so many, who were impacted by the storm that came through. God, I pray just for your supernatural provision. God, I pray for those who are just feeling so overwhelmed and, and weighed down because of wait times and not being able to find the right people and finances. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you would put the pieces together. Would this be just such an excellent time for the community, the body of Christ to rally around neighbor God, around one another, to lift each other up in support and to step in and use our unique gifts and skills to just help one another, help lift burdens up off of people. God, I thank you that we're okay. Father, I pray though for those who are grieving loss, Lord. I think of my neighbor who lost her son because of the storm. Would you be with her, God? Would you give her supernatural peace as she grieves and comfort, Lord, that she is not alone. God, I just pray for this service. I pray that as we look to giving, God, that you would show us what that means, that you would allow us to trust in you with everything. God, you are the giver of good gifts. And so, God, I pray, Jesus, that we would just let go of control, that we would trust that you are faithful to provide. God, that you would help us have the courage to just take risks in giving, just extravagantly and generously to others around us. God, be with Cameron as he preaches today. Thank you for his study and his time, God, and for just, um, God, how he's going to bring us the word today. May it be fresh and may it fall on good soil, God, and may we see great fruit come from it. In your name we pray, amen. These are your announcements for this week. We are promoting the registration still for our kids' summer camp, Monumental. This is for all kids age 6 to 11, so that's going into grade 1, to going into grade six. It's a full day day camp, July 11th to the 15th. Camp is a week long time for kids to have so much fun, but also through that fun, getting to be spiritually formed and grow in their relationship with God and relationship with each other. Your kids will not wanna miss out. So head to our website, calvaryptbo.church to register today. You can also now register for our all crew celebration. All Crew is what we call our team here at Calvary that serves in any capacity. It's everybody that serves. We've been meeting on the last Sunday of every month, and we are taking a break for, of, from that over the summer. But before we go and break, we want to take a moment to just celebrate together first. June 5th, following the service for anybody who serves here at Calvary and their family. There will be bouncy castles, cotton candy games, a barbecue, an award ceremony of types where we celebrate those that have served so well. This is really is just our chance to thank you for your faithful serving week after week after week. Our kids giving campaign for our new kids area is so close to being finished. We have met 94% of our goal and we are only, get this, $900 away from raising $15,000, which will be matched, remember, by a generous donor to meet our $25,000 goal. All you have to do is write Kids Giving Campaign on your donation and it will be directed to the right place. Now, for those who call Calvary Church home, there are three ways that you can give. First, you can give online at calvaryptbo.church. Just click on the Giving tab at the top of the page. You can also e-transfer to donations at calvaryptbo.church or you can drop it off at the white giving boxes in the back if you are on campus or just come by the main office during the week. Now grab your Bible and be ready to take notes as we head into our time of teaching with Cameron Bell. Well, good morning, Calvary. I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. My name is Cameron. For some of you may recognize me, others, this might be our first in encounter. Uh, to that, it's my pleasure to meet you. Uh, as I said, I'm a member of the staff team here at Calvary with a focus on the finance department and related areas. I've been a Peterborough resident for almost two years now, but I've lived in this city for about four years, including my time at Master's College and Seminary. It's been an eventful two years since I started serving here at Calvary, hasn't it? 
perhaps because of this turbulent season, I'm even more grateful to be here with the opportunity to share from God's word and the truth that I believe he's wanting us all to be made aware of this morning. Over the next few weeks, we'll be exploring a topic that I believe is so fundamental to your journey as a Jesus follower and for my journey as a follower of Jesus also. The series is titled Open Handed. It's a look at the life of a generous disciple of Jesus and how to walk along that path. And today we're going to start discussing some of those key ideas. But first, I'm curious to know if you remember this popular culture item from several years ago. On March 14th, 2010, a new documentary series aired on the TLC network titled Hoarding, Buried Alive. Do you remember this? The show follows a story of individuals through their life experience and and addresses their illness and the impact that it has on their lives. The illness is hoarding. It's defined as having the persistent difficulty of getting rid of or parting with possessions due to a perceived need to save uh, their items. For people who have this condition, attempts to part with the possessions creates a a considerable distress and, and leads to the decision to save the things that they would be discarding. The result of this behavior is is clutter of substantial proportions, disrupting ability to use living spaces or even entire dwellings. According to an article written by the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, hoarding is the the persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their actual value. Behavior associated with this condition includes feelings of extreme anxiety, distress, and obsessive thoughts and actions related to the fear of running out uh, of an item or or needing it in the future. And the phenomena of this show on the TLC network led to five total seasons featuring 82 episodes and it set set out to serve the purpose of providing an insight uh, into this behavior, into this psychological condition as, as well as creating awareness, and and whether that awareness is positive or negative, uh, it's a a different debate for a different environment than this. And having been exposed to fractions of episodes on the air, I I found myself entranced by the scale of clutter featured in the show, but also a fascination with the level of fear and anxiety that would lead to this kind of activity. And now, before going any further, I want to show an appropriate amount of respect to this recognize psychological condition and acknowledge that there's a difference between this behavior and, and, and the, the, the behavior that we might be experiencing. But I feel like it's an interesting question, you know, to reflect on uh, in your life and in my life, to ask the question, am I afraid to run out? Although not limited to our society and our, our culture today, we live in a world where it's easy to be afraid of running out. Seemingly, there are so many demands that crop up in the modern life that can stretch a person, regardless of who you are, whether you're introverted or extroverted, a student, adult, or even the age of retirement, whether you're a follower of Jesus or just checking out that lifestyle, the demands of this life can leave you as a person feeling pulled in all directions. Just to name a few of these demands, there's the demand to manage how people view us, right? Our, our persona, our outward social profile, uh, needing to broadcast the number of friends or, or the wealth that we have or, or the amount of fun we have in our spare time. You feel like you have less fun or wealth or friends than those around you, you, you might be feeling like you're going without. There's the demand to manage your personal schedule, you know, maximizing the, the time that seems limited, that's available to us through life hacks or shortcuts while also setting up time for your family and and serving at church and working, not to mention time for self-care and self-improvement. You feel like you can't manage that all in your limited schedule? Well, you you might be feeling like you don't have enough of time. There's also the demand to compete with our perception of others through social media or comparing the highlights of others to our seemingly mundane routines. You feel like you don't have the same highlights happening in your life, you might begin to believe that you're not as capable or or skilled or gifted as you should be. And in addition to these general pressures, there are real events that can make us feel like we are running out. Some some of these events, they crop up uh, unannounced in our life and they encourage anxiety and fear. 
like maybe the sudden notice of unemployment or maybe it's you're, uh, you want to enter the housing market with your family but it, you seem unable to or, or you just feel a general lack of meaningful personal relationships in your life. Maybe it's a debt that never seems to disappear or just a general lack of personal resources. You know, the list can be so long and compounded with one another, it just begins to feel overwhelming. And in this world in which we live, it can become so easy to finish the day still wanting, or even to start the day and you just feel behind. If you're like me, maybe you even wake up in the middle of the night and you're staring at the ceiling, just thinking about all the needs that you have in your life. And what can happen to us as people over time through this repeated pattern of worrying and stressing and wanting, gradually we begin to shift our thoughts and our perspective, our view of the world into a place where we start off the day already feeling like we don't have what we need, like we're disadvantaged. And it becomes difficult to think outside of ourselves and, and to commit ourselves to action beyond our own benefit. We can begin to embrace this disposition in our lives in which we think about our environment with an attitude of scarcity. It can become so easy to just assume in a situation insufficiency, undersupply, lack, or inadequacy. And over time, our priority shifts from living out our purpose in life to building up a hedge between us and the other needs and the needs in our lives. Do you ever feel this way? Truthfully, I do. And I believe that we all can, every one of us, assume this mentality in seasons of our lives without even knowing it. It can become such a casual drift that we don't realize our perspective shifting to a mindset of scarcity. And here's an extreme statement for you. That the scarcity mindset is actually a plague upon the human soul. I, I know it's, a, it's an extreme statement, but the reality is that the trap of believing that you are living without, it's a lie. And it's a lie that's existed for the history of humanity. It diseases those who buy into its pessimistic fallacy. See, if we were to sit down together and read through the Bible or any record of history, we would encounter story after story of individuals who struggle to believe that they have all that they need. This behavior, what, what I, I'm starting to call the scarcity complex, it's the source of conflict and war, greed, violence, oppression, injustice and deception, and, and, and the list goes on. And the biblical story itself is just a long story with this scarcity fallacy at its thematic center. In it is the documented shift from reliance on our Father, our God, to complete reliance on ourselves. It's a dependency on ourselves that has a tendency to fall short. So when you read the scripture, there's your first encouragement right there. You don't need to feel alone in your anxiety of going without. See, it's actually a human trend. As I mentioned before, literally from the beginning of human history, humanity has always been prone to wonder, are they going without? And as we move into our scripture passage for today, it's important that we consider the reality of our issue in the context of our identity as a human person, not just your situation and my situation, but as our identity as humanity both in limitation and potential. And as we move to our scripture passage this morning, who better to speak to this issue concerning the limitations of our humanity than the incarnate Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth, who was fully God, but also fully human in his existence. See, Jesus is sent to be the mediator for us, and he demonstrates a precise knowledge of how you and I can begin to fear going without. In one of his most famous sermons, the, the Sermon on the Mount, clearly Jesus knows what troubled the hearts of the people around him, and he knows what continues to trouble our hearts today. The Sermon on the Mount is a teaching that Jesus delivered in the region of Galilee, which is just north of Judea in the, in the Middle East. To, um, he delivered it to what the Gospel writer Matthew describes as crowds of people following him around. And in the gospel narrative, this sermon is delivered almost immediately after a, another story in which Jesus spends 40 days in the desert fasting without food or water. 
And, and maybe you know the story in this, in this period of fasting, Jesus encounters this other character and, and temptation. Um, in the Greek, this other character is referred to as the tempter, and he taunts Jesus to solve his problem of hunger and thirst by offering other solutions. And while the other solutions are problematic when we read the story, they are solutions that would solve his extreme situation of going without. Yet Jesus, he's greatly aware of the scarcity fallacy. He, he's not buying into the lie, into the fear of going without. And actually in that challenge, uh, he knows the truth and he overcomes temptation, uh, ending that part of the story. And so when we reach the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus has just finished this period of experiencing real human limitation uh, and insufficiency. But then he begins to preach to these crowds in Galilee, and he is intent on setting the record straight. Amidst other wise teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives us these incredible words of promise and wisdom, both relevant for the ancient world and also for us today. We're reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 25. He says, That is why I do not tell, I, I tell you to not worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Can you imagine sitting in on that sermon over 2,000 years ago? Matthew tells us that there were Crowds following Jesus around, and they're probably all eagerly standing or crouching on the terrain somewhere in Galilee, just listening intently to the teacher speak. And, and they come with their own worries and their own fear, and this is how he addressed them. But maybe you're listening to those words and you're thinking about the equation. Uh, if I'm not caring about my needs, who is? Do, do his words kind of seem blunt to you? Do they hit you with little disappointment? I'll be honest, if you're flipping through your Bible, looking for an encouraging word, and you come across this statement, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? You're probably not going to make a poster out of it, right? If you're reading the passage quickly, you might, you might get that impression, oh, great, Jesus, you're just reminding me of my own mortality. M maybe this is just me. It almost sounds like what a parent would say after being asked the same question repeatedly by their child, right? Don't worry about it, right? Like I can think in my own life, you know? Mom and Dad, are we there yet? Cameron, don't worry about it. <laughs> but looking deeper than just a first glance, there is something so deep and overwhelming offered in this statement. It's another alternative, an alternative to the fallacy of scarcity, and a course correction, actually, for the whole of humanity. It's simple. Don't worry. He teaches the crowds that the response to anxiety for tomorrow is that we just don't need to be concerned about it. But why? Don't you ask that question, why Jesus? Right, he, he tells us that our Father knows our needs, but you and I could probably argue that we're aware of our own needs too. You know, he claims that the Father cares more for us than birds and flowers, but it doesn't seem to be a whole lot of action promised in his words. And maybe that's a reason why this scripture could be a hang up for some, because in this passage, Jesus is only telling us to just stop fixating on the issue. He doesn't tell us how we can fix it. And this is the solution. This is the missing part of the equation. The, the truth is that there's actually nothing that you and I can do to fix the issue. We can't solve the fear of running out on our own. We don't need to worry about tomorrow, but it's actually not because of what we do. 
the answer is because our God is just overwhelmingly generous. This is our main point for this morning. We don't need to be concerned on what we need for the future because our Father cares so deeply for us that he'll give it to us. In seeking his kingdom or, or by actively following him, we're promised to have everything that we need. And it's because of the greatness of the God that we serve that we don't need to worry about the future. You see, friends, generosity is a core characteristic of who God is. It's the quality of his that is good, compassionate, and gracious. And it's central to who he is. In fact, it could be argued that all of his attributes are integrated and affected by the central fact that God is good and that he is generous. This attribute of his is not like a binding characteristic, right, that we just use to study him. Sometimes I, I think we can refer to the attributes of God kind of like, you know, sports statistics, right? Like we can rhyme them off, you know, God is omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's eternal, I know him, right? But if that's, if that's the only takeaway that we have for today, then we've, we've missed the mark. To know God as a generous God is, is to know him as benevolent. It, it's to know your, your father, your heavenly father, who is wanting to generously bless you in your life with his goodness. It's an intimate quality of his because his, his gifts are personal and intimate in nature. We, we all know the difference, right, between receiving a gift that was obviously picked up at the last minute or, or maybe it's a group a gift at Christmas time from your corporate workplace. But how precious is true generosity when you experience uh, someone has selected a gift in a deep and, and meaningful way, maybe chosen by a, a close friend or, or even a gift that has been made by a special loved one? This is, this is how we can think about the perfect goodness of God. We, we can see evidence of his goodness all throughout Scripture. And in fact, in the biblical narrative, his generous nature is, is how he introduces himself to humanity. Maybe you're familiar with this verse in Exodus 34, uh, verse 6. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. In the book, God Has a Name, pastor and author John Mark Comer relates the generous compassion of God in this verse to the compassion that a parent feels about their children, right? It's a, a closeness, a, a parental care for us, a passion. That's what compassion means, with passion, that is manifested for us in his generous, benevolent action. That's the goodness of God. In the New Testament, the, the book of James, written by author and brother of Jesus, James, he teaches about God's perfect generosity by saying, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from the God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. And in this respect, anything that is actually, anything in the world that is good is considered God's work to us, you know, for our benefit and delight. So if we go back to Matthew chapter 6 and and we read the teaching of Jesus. We read the words of our Lord, who knows the depths of the Father's love for creation. We know that the message communicated in his words is that of like a parental care, a deep intimacy in it, a desire for good in our lives from the one who is good. We hear the words of Jesus and we can be encouraged that the will of the Father is actually to remove all of our concern for tomorrow, remove all our fear and anxiety of going without because he knows what we need. It's true. We all need to be reminded of God's generosity. We reflect on it. We, we worship God because of it. We pray to him because we believe he cares and that he's listening. It's one of the reasons that we gather together, whether online or in person, so that we can share in the testimony of God's goodness to us with one another. We celebrate together. So in the light of his goodness, we can be encouraged. We can lean on the understanding of who God is, that he's desiring great things for us. And in the presence of opposition or doubt, we have the foundation of thought to rest our confidence in. But today I would actually like to encourage each one of us to move just beyond the head knowledge of his goodness. I want to introduce to you, maybe even for the first time, that God's goodness is much more than just a theory to be studied. It's, it's not the knowledge of the generosity of God that will affect your life in a changing altering way. And I'd suggest to you that actually the, the full benefit of God's generosity is when you encounter his presence in the realization that 
He's being generous to you in this moment. And that he's covered you with his goodness from the genesis of your existence. Do you believe that today? Do you think about your life in the context of God's overwhelming generosity to you? See, if you're, if you're struggling to get there here today, here are two major details for you to consider. Number one, he created you. Have you ever internalized the weight of what it means to be designed intentionally by a loving father? Scripture tells us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made and, and that we're actually made in the image of the good God. Number two, he saved you. We celebrate this every month with the practice or the ordinance of communion in which we reflect on his generous action of sacrifice. See, not only did God love you to breathe in you the gift of life, but he also loved the world, which includes you, so much that he gave his only son that you might have everlasting life. Isn't that a great thought? Imagine living and working with others in, in a moment of just continuous gratitude for what he's done in your life. Like a suspended state in which you're just always thinking about it. When you interact with other people, you say, yeah, I've been saved. I didn't have to do anything to earn it. It feels, it feels great. I'm so thankful. The God who made the whole universe made me, and he knows the number of hairs on my head. Isn't that cool? So my worries for tomorrow, they don't even make sense in the light of who my father is. And when we know this, when, when we have internalized it within us, the, the effects of the scarcity complex seem to be reversed. In fact, when I know that I'm created in the image of my benevolent God, the goal of my life is actually to follow him, to, to model my life after Christ, call him King Jesus, the, the God who came to earth and surrendered all that he had. But now he's glorified and rules over creation, and I, I no longer need to focus inwardly. I actually begin to interact with the world around me from a mindset not of scarcity, but of abundance. It's a mindset when I'm able to give to others and still have what I need. And as we explore the topic of our own generosity in the weeks to come, it's a generosity that we're capable of and we're actually called to in this life. It's fundamental for us to know that only good generosity, only true, only helpful generosity exists when it is imaged in the likeness of the generosity of the God that we serve and that his goodness it's actually the starting point for living an open-handed life. So, some closing thoughts for us this morning. Perhaps you're here today and you're joining us and you're so thankful for the generosity of God in your life. Just be encouraged, be encouraged today. Be, be reminded that God is good and continue to praise him. Continually remember the presence of God in your life and the wonderful gifts that he's given to you. Continue to follow him in every area of your life and, and witness his generosity to you in just unimaginable ways. And, and perhaps you might find that as you follow him, as you do, as he says, and, and you go where he guides, you might find his generosity overflowing in your life and affecting the people around you. Maybe you're here today and you would love to believe in a reality where God can be trusted to care for your needs. But maybe in your experience, the idea of a good God just doesn't line up. Maybe something you've asked him for in the past seems like it's been ignored, or maybe you've seen something or ex experienced something in your life you never thought a good God would allow. And so the thought of hearing this today, a thought of a good God seems distant from where you're at. Can I encourage you? You're loved and, 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 and cared for, and I just desire for you to not let your past experience detract from your desire to learn more about the God that I call Father, the, the God that your friends maybe long to hear from, that maybe your family longs to talk to, the, the God that this community of people gathers to worship, please don't put up walls that hinder him from demonstrating his generosity to you, that, that limit the opportunities for him to make his presence known in your life. Just find someone, find a, a friend or family member, a trusted person in your life, and, and ask them about their experience with the benevolent God. Share with them your burdens, your hang-ups, and, and just know that as you, as you continue to seek God, He actually promises to find you if, if you seek Him with all your heart, and He will make Himself known to you. 
maybe you're here today and the idea of a generous God has just been introduced to you. I, again, I would continue uh, to encourage you, conti- continue to learn more. If, talk to a friend or family member or even connect with one of our pastoral staff who would be pleased to continue the conversation of who God is and who God can be in your life. If you're looking for a starting place uh, right now, you can even just go to your Bible or, or download the Bible app online and, and begin to read the Gospels. That's the, the first four books of the New Testament. Just to begin to discover the person of Jesus. Just take some sort of action step today. As we shift gears and, and close out for this morning, let's just consider the example that our Father has displayed for us with his goodness to us. We've discussed the generosity of God that has been extended to us and no strings attached. Does that knowledge affect you today? It has the potential to. It, it should embolden you. It, it make you feel empowered as a son or daughter of the Most High, not, not in some distant parental relationship, but an intimate relationship, a blessing over your life because you're deeply cared for. You have the care of the maker of everything and are called to live in partnership with him as you live and work to be his kingdom here on the earth. And as you partner with him, you're changed by the goodness that he gives and and the goodness that he is, right? As you follow him and learn from him, allow his spirit to work with you and in you because you will find that your journey in following him will make you a more generous person. It's because he is. And the more you shape your life around him, the more that this will be revealed to you. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, today we take this moment, this opportunity to honor you for who you are. Today we stand or we sit wherever we are and, and, and we just sit in awe of how great your generosity really is to us. We praise your name in this moment because we recognize that all the good things in our lives are gifts from you, that our very life is a gift from you, that our eternity is not uncertain because of you. Father, today we recognize we wouldn't wouldn't get very far living without you. And, And I apologize today for all the times that I try and do that anyways. Holy Spirit, would you just please fill me with gratitude for all that I have been given. Holy Spirit, would you fill all of my friends who are willing with gratitude for all that they have been given. Continue to be with us as we commit ourselves to seeking your kingdom on this earth and to trust you for all of our needs. And Spirit of God, please equip us with your power to be transformed by you, to become like you, and to be a light of who you are as generous people in this world. Amen. Thank you so much, Cameron, for sharing with us this morning. Be encouraged today, everybody, to step up and see what trusting in God can do. We are so glad that each and every one of you joined us today. I pray that you're filled up with hope, that you're encouraged, and that you will come back again next week. We can't wait to see you then. Have a great week.